eventually, every dungeon master gets bored of playing with the modules, the world given to us by the books of Dungeons and Dragons. And we decide, what the hell, let's build our own world. Dungeons and Dragons is a game in our heads, meaning that our imagination can run wild. As DMs, you can craft your own world for your players. And, well, admittedly, the allure is quite effective. I mean, who doesn't want to craft their own fantasy world? It's just an incredible feeling of creation. However, world building can be very, very difficult. Author Brandon Sanderson, however, has a couple laws. Well, not a couple. He has three laws that can make it a little bit easier. If you don't know who he is, Brandon Sanderson is one of the world's most influential and incredible writers of fantasy. And these three laws can make world building just that much better for us DMs of Dungeons and Dragons and any tabletop role playing game. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Sanderson's first law. An author's ability to solve conflict satisfactorily with magic is directly proportional to how well the reader understands said magic. I'm not going to get into this one too much because if I do, I feel like I'm going to be going into straight up writing advice and that's not something that I'm incredibly comfortable with giving because I don't really think I qualify. However, there are plenty of videos that talk all about soft and hard magic systems. I'll oversimplify it a little bit here, but soft magic system is basically one without so many rules or set boundaries. Take Gandalf from Lord of the Rings. A hard magic system is a magic system with rules and boundaries that are clearly set that the audience usually knows. Take Avatar The Last Airbender. Usually in D&D campaigns, DMs will stick to the established hard magic system in Dungeons and Dragons. We know how spells work in D&D. There are set rules, set schools of magic, ways of casting spells, different types of magic users, etc. The reason DMs don't touch this is because magic in D&D is tied to the rules of the game. And when making a homebrew world, adjusting the rules of the game, well, that is a completely different type of writing that is, to me at least, way, way more difficult. However, in a low magic setting, a setting without much magic, a setting where your characters might not be able to take advantage of those wizard, warlock, cleric, etc., that is where a soft magic system can shine. Now, I am not going to get too much into this again because I don't feel like I'm qualified to talk about writing advice here, but just know that it is important to your campaign. I do recommend, if you're creating your first homebrew world, go with the hard magic system already established in D&D. It's not overly complicated, it's pretty simple, it's open to a little bit of interpretation from the DM so that you have storytelling options. It is useful. I don't recommend writing a separate hard magic system entirely that requires you to put in a lot more effort than I think is worth it, and ditching magic in Dungeons and Dragons for a more soft magic system or a low magic campaign, I don't recommend either just because if you're doing your first campaign, it's restricting a lot of options for you. But of course, to each their own, that is just my opinion. Now we're going to move on to Sanderson's second law. Limitations are more important than powers. This one is incredibly relevant to Dungeons and Dragons. When DMs are writing NPCs, and this applies to characters, when players are writing characters, we often don't really consider their faults, their flaws. Now, Sanderson is referring to faults in abilities. Take how Superman has all of these powers like flight and heat vision, freeze breath, etc. But he's weak to kryptonite. That's his power flaw. But I'm also referring to character flaws in Dungeons and Dragons because I find that those are the most important part of building a player character or an NPC. And often something that is 
forgotten. Some of the most interesting conflict in my campaign has stemmed from individual character flaws, both in NPCs and in players. In my current homebrew campaign, which I talk about all the time because it's amazing, in my current homebrew campaign, the cleric has the fault of being a little bit nosy. She likes learning things, really likes learning things, and that's a good thing. She reads up on lore, she checks the facts, she's really good at knowledge. She's a master linguist and knows a ton of languages. It's really cool, but that love of knowledge has often been her downfall. For example, there was one time where a mafia hitman basically told her, don't come to our meeting, I don't want you there, just stay back here. I'll go to the meeting, you just wait. Instead of waiting, she decided to nose in and try to listen in on what was going on, and then the cleric got shot. It wasn't any permanent damage, but that was a decision that made sense for her character that created interesting conflict. And that's what faults are all about. Stories, especially D&D, are not going to be interesting without conflict. And conflict that arises from player-driven faults or faults in NPCs are always going to be interesting. Now, of course, now let's talk about what the law is actually referring to, faults in powers. This is getting straight into a power gaming debate, and for a story-driven campaign, I will usually recommend that players refrain from power gaming. I do think it is important, however, for players to be powerful. It is a bit game still. This is not a book. This is a game. And players should feel powerful in this fantasy role-playing game. And D&D does have built-in faults to each class. Classes are good at some things and bad at some things. That's how it's going to work. You as the DM should try to exploit these weaknesses to occasionally kick your players' butts because it is important for your players to lose every now and then. Their limitations should show through and create more conflict. That is a large part of what this law is about. Create conflict through limitations. Being powerful is great, but there are a limited number of powers and an endless number of faults and limitations that can create interesting conflict for your story and make your world all the better. Sanderson's Third Law. Expand what you already have before you add something new. This is one I talk about a lot. You cannot have the vastness of an ocean, but the depth of a puddle when it comes to world building. What do I mean by that? You can write down basic information about a hundred cities, but that's not going to help you when your players visit those cities. You only have the basic description. You don't have any characters. You don't have any government. You don't have any society, culture, conflict, story, quest hooks. A basic description doesn't mean anything. Your players don't care that you've named every city on the continent, that you have a couple characters made. If there's not one that's just detailed enough for them to actually explore, you need to have depth. And that doesn't just apply to literal things like locations or people, it's more than that. Your stories have to be good too. You can't have a hundred quests, but they're all just kill X thing with no given reason. Having depth to the quests you give your players is incredibly important to fleshing out an interesting campaign. That's even, well, in my opinion, maybe not even more important, but just as important as making an interesting world. Your players need to play an interesting campaign. A sandbox is great, but you need to give them at least something to interact with. It's not just them creating all the fun all the time. You need to put a little bit of effort into giving them a hook. As I said in the first episode of this series, focus on what your players are doing session by session basis. Flesh out where they are. Give depth to what they're actually doing. The example I gave before still applies. 
Your players don't care about the Dwarven Kingdoms 1,000 miles away that they're probably never going to visit. Flesh out what they're doing. I'm not saying that you shouldn't expand your world past what your players are immediately questing through. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that what your players are doing should take priority. It should always take priority. And it's a good way, it's a good goal setter for you to follow your player's quest so that you can keep track of what you're building in your world without going through and randomly creating things, if that makes sense. I don't know if I explained that well, but I tried. Basically, what I'm saying is use your players and their quests as a guide when you're world building. You're following them just as much as they're following your story. As you follow their quest, flesh out the locations they choose to go through so that you give depth to the world around them. Your players have no idea that a city that they may not visit hasn't been developed yet. I personally have struggled with this. A lot of my world is not yet fully fleshed out. I've been developing it on a case by case basis with my players. One of my players created a blood hunter and when she did that, I created three blood hunter factions, one of which I sent to her as lore. I had no plans previously to flesh out any sort of blood hunter organization, but because she did that, I had incentive to create a new culture for my world, and now it's more rich because of it. I am following them just as much as they're following me. Now I mentioned before that fleshing out your world past your players is not a problem. It is a good thing. And once you get past what your players are just doing in the moment, Fleshing out your world past them is a great idea. Giving it depth is good, but make sure you're organized about it. Don't go about randomly. And don't flesh out elements that you're just not interested in at the moment. You don't want to get burnt out when writing your D&D campaign. That would be silly. You should have fun doing this. World building is fun. Yes, maybe writing it all down isn't the most enjoyable process, but creating the ideas, and to me at least, putting them on paper and storing them in a little neat binder is really, really cool. So, make sure you're organized when you're building past your players. You need to have a structure so you don't get overwhelmed. That's how I'm going to end this point. Don't get overwhelmed above all things we as DMs on our first try are not going to create Exandria from Critical Role or the Wizarding World from Harry Potter it's not going to happen that stuff takes years of building and idea crafting it is hard to build a world and you're not gonna get it your first try but be proud of what you do how many people can say that they, for a group of five friends, created an entire fantasy world. Not much. I love, absolutely adore, seeing my players obsess over a story I created. That feels amazing. Seeing them freak out about big reveals, seeing them get panicked about the bad guys winning, seeing them be happy when they're winning. It, it's amazing. That's really the only thing I can describe it as. Don't get overwhelmed when you create a world. Follow these rules, and I hope that it makes your world building just a little bit easier. All right, that is where we're going to end it off for today. If you guys enjoyed this video, please hit that like button. If you want to see more episodes of Tabletop Tavern Tips as well as my other series, RPG Horror Stories, then please do hit that subscribe button and subscribe to Crispy's Tavern. And finally, if you want to leave your own tips, response, story down below, go down to the comments. In essence, like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell.